was born in Welsh, West Virginia. I was born a poor, poor black child. Now, I actually said that in an all-black church in Atlanta, and it was dead quiet. Five, 20,000 members. And I was trying to be Steve Martin, you know, the jerk. I felt like a jerk. And the cardinal's sitting there, and he's like turning white. And, uh, and I thought, oh, God, somebody save me. You know? And finally, this big soprano woman in the choir just, ah! everybody laugh, and it was fun from there on. But um, I'm careful about that. <laughs> but anyway, I was born in uh, Welch, West Virginia, in uh, number 10 Pocahontas Coalfields. Um, my dad was a illiterate coal miner, and my mother taught him to read and write. And boy, did she unleash a, a monster there, because um, he went into mechanics, auto mechanics. He's gifted at it. And his auto mechanics was uh, so good. Um, I was kind of fortunate. My mother's parent, my grandfather, uh, worried some of you conspiracy people going to love this. He was a 33rd level knighted mason. So I'm from that house. And um, he, he, you have, he was the district foreman. Um, he was the manager of all the coal fields. So it's like a, it's like a governor. And uh, he didn't want his uh, grandchildren being fatherless. So he pulled my dad out of the coal mines and got him a garage. And he started it. And man, it took off crazy. Business really went crazy and did really well. But I remember at 3 o'clock in the morning, my parents nailing blankets over the windows at night. And these cars would pull in. And it was Dad's best customers. They all paid cash. And they had 200-gallon tanks in the trunk. And it's not gasoline. <laughs> They're moon runners. Dad would tune up a 392 Chrysler Hemi engine and get that thing to it's like a, it's a Mopar missile. And um, they would take off, and the reason they didn't see the lights, revenueers are looking for garages, trying to find these high-powered cars so they can catch the bootleggers. Well, why is that important? These bootleggers were people like Buddy Baker and Fred Lorenzen. Uh, these are all NASCAR champion drivers. That's why NASCAR got started. They were bootleg drivers. <laughs> and they drive after the revenueers. I'm not making this up. It's history. So, anyway, that's really important because Dad was um, working in the garage. It was morning time, and um, a man pulled in. His car broke down. And it's a very complicated carburetor called a Spicer. It had a water jacket around it. They don't have anything like that today. It takes about a half a day or a day to change it. Dad did it in 30 minutes. And the man was watching how fast my dad was. And he goes, um, you always work this fast? And he goes... Yeah, when I can see what I'm doing, and he didn't get the joke. So he said, well, I'm coming from Detroit. I'm on my way to Daytona. I, I would like to hire you as my mechanic. Dad said, yeah, you want me to work? work? Yeah, we're going to race on the beach down there. He goes, uh, hi, my name is Lee Petty. He has, that's the father of a guy named Richard Petty. And if you don't know who that is, look it up on the Internet. Winner of 200 national NASCAR races awards. The, the, they call him King Richard. I grew up in this world. The first thing I built that was really, I thought was significant, was uh, I was 12 years old and I built this 426 Chrysler Hemi engine from the block up. And people wonder, how does you know, a guy in science and computer stuff, how do you get arms like that? And I said, well, that's because honing big blocks. And they said, God. Uh, the, the honer weighed more than I did. But um, when I got through with that engine, it turned down the, dyna, the dynamometer. We had 900 horsepower engine. So we dropped that in, and Richard won a Grand National. And so my dad's going, wow, my son built the, the Grand National w winning engine. And, uh, and Lee and Richard came over to dad and told him, uh, Fred, we can't say anything about that. Why? Um, there's a man over there named Bill France, chairman of NASCAR. He's going to hang us from the tree over here because that's a 12-year-old. This is the child labor laws, you know, we, NASCAR laws, all kinds of things. And so they said, uh, okay, uh, David, you, uh, I don't care. I'm not going to say anything. So Richard's looking at me. He goes, I don't feel bad about this. Anything we do for you? I went, yeah, actually you could. Uh, could I have the keys to the shop? 
And they said, sure, is there any materials you need? You never thought of this, I bet, but a NASCAR shop and a NASA rocket shop are the same shops because both shops deliver one product, speed. We have the same tools, the same machines, the same fuels, because we ran dragsters, methyl, nit nitro, liquid oxygen. So it was all there, all the equipment, all the materials, and I know how to use it. So first thing, I, I, they said, what are you going to do? I'd like to build some things. Just a kid, yeah, build whatever you want. If you can't find it, order it. We'll, we'll get it for you. So the first thing I built was a, a nearly nine-foot rocket taller, higher than the ceiling. And it's, it's, a, it's a cryogenic pumper. What that means is it's a, I'm working with cryogenic, 325 degrees below zero. That's the fuels. That's how cold they are. Special handling equipment, all that stuff involved. But I got the thing built, and it's sitting out there. I got it out to the backyard, and my friends are looking at it. Stand right next to it. And, you know, it's, it's vaporizing, uh, equalizing the pressure in the tanks. And they're used to lighting bottle rockets off, you know, stand up, you know, and that's fun. I said, hey, y'all can't be there. I'm like from here to the foyer of this building. I said, you got to come up here. You know, I'm yelling at them. They came up there. Why are you going to be all the way up here? Because you don't want to be down there. And my, last time my mother saw my friends, they were standing by the rocket. Well, she's in the house, and everything in the house just starts moving across the counters. <laughs> and I'm turning the switch on, the pumps are engaged. Finally, it takes off. It takes off all right. It goes 52,000 feet. That's over 10 miles. And it looks like a NASA launch. I mean, I got a plume shoot miles long. And what was the yard down there was just this burnt crisp thing about the size of a football field, just burnt to death. My mother come running out. First, she's, my friends were standing right here, all four of them. My mother come around. Where's your friends? I turn around. And I she says, where are they? She thought they were down by the rocket, you know. I said, well, they were, they're probably in the next county by now because we're not, they weren't allowed to play with matches. So, <laughs> so my mother, <laughs> I've learned how to speak from Daniel Brinkley. So, <laughs> so anyway, I love Daniel. Anyway, uh, the rocket's roaring, and I mean, it's rolling thunder. If you've ever been under a big rocket launch, it rolls, the thunder rolls out, and you can hear it rolling in the distance. And I'm looking around, it's clear blue skies, and I thought, man, somebody's going to know, what is that rolling thunder? And um, so I'm standing here watching it, and my mother's standing next to me, and we're watching it go up, and I was saying, um, why am I, what is so weird about me? I won't see my friends until next month, maybe. And... My mother's looking at it, and she goes, well, I'll just tell you this, Dave. It took me years to figure this out. Actually, metaphysical people helped me figure it out. My mother said, look, David, you didn't come from me. You came through me. <laughs> so I was just sitting there, and, and my mother was ahead of her time. But anyway, that was the start of many, many uh, rockets. Things got bigger and faster. And... About the time that started, then uh, these weird dreams started. And maybe I should back up real quick on something. Um, I, here I am, and I uh, started off in West, West Virginia. And when I was seven years old, I'm sitting in the library in a corner where the science books are, and I sit on the floor and read them because I'm there all day. I didn't want to take up an adult seat. So I'm reading, and finally a librarian comes over. She's about 75. She looked at me. What are you reading? I said, the science books. She picked up and looked at it. She said, how many of these have you read? All of them. There's 250 books here. Yeah, I read them all. How much do you remember? All of it. <laughs> and she said, yeah. So she just up and grabs this book, holds it to me, and it says singularity. She opens it up, and she goes, tell me about it. Well, where are you in the book? She goes, uh, I'm in the third chapter, first paragraph. Singularity is a force where you have a convergent duck of a gravitational field which will build into a graviton. That will be affected upon other outside force. And she's going, slams the book, okay. So you puts it back up, okay, so you do know this stuff. Would you like some more books? I said, yeah, but we're in West Virginia, you know, it's 1960. So she said, um, I'll tell you what, um, this summer, 
join the summer program and I'll make you a librarian. And smart woman. 14 girls stand there and I'm a, there's, I got a picture of it and I'm in the center, the only boy, and I'm a librarian. But I was allowed to order books from all over the world. Free. And I st that little old lady, she don't know what she turned loose on the world. Because <laughs> after I ordered about 1,100 books, everything available on planet Earth at the time, that's when at age 12, I decided, I think I'll build a different kind of rocket engine. And, and friends of mine knew some rockets. Said, well, there's solid fuel and liquid fuel. Well, what are you going to build? Neither one. What are you going to build? I don't even have a name for it. Um, I think... I think what it's going to be called, it'll be an electromagnetic fusion containment engine. What is that? Well, basically, it's going to be a magnetic bottle, and inside the magnetic bottle, there'll be force fields, and they will hold the nuclear chain reaction. What are you talking about? Detonate an H-bomb and contain it. What? Yeah, it can be done. And um, so basically, with the singularity application, and I did with the... Uh, the configuration that I came up with this thing, um, it allowed me to build a containment cell. And once, you know, credibility starts getting stretched here, you know, this can't be happening. Well, let me tell you something. Um, what has been going on for the last 80 years over in fusion containment communities, uh, they're on the wrong design. They've been on the wrong design for eight decades. I've tried to tell them it's another type of design. And they keep doing the same thing over and over, looking for different results. And Einstein called that what? Insanity. Insanity. And I didn't want to call these people insane, but, yeah. you know, I just shoe fit. So they're still, they have one half. It, it will take, the, it takes twice what they're working with. Um, the official rule right now in fusion containment community is that they can get it done in 40 more years and $80 billion more. <laughs> the money was okay, but it was the years that got me. 40 years. Why is that 40? That's, a, that's the time of a career. So they're going from career to career. And they don't care if they get it done. And that's why 80 years later, you still don't have containment. I can't believe I'm still this far ahead. But... What ha well, maybe I cheated. <laughs> what, ha what happened was these dreams started when I was 12. And I wake up and I try to write it down. Couldn't see in the dark anyway. But my mother, she took my lamp and stripped the bottom of it off and made it an open uh, neutral negative on the lamp. And all I had to do was touch it. It turns on. This is 1960. My mother made the first touch lamp. So I'd wake up and touch the lamp. And I write down on a big artist pad what I remembered, go back to sleep, wake up next morning, can't remember anything, flip the book open, look at it, I remember all that. And I transfer it to a notebook. But this is where it started getting weird. Every time I go to sleep, right where the equation ended, I'd start. 93 pages I went through in, in total sleeping time, three months. And there it was. And, and I was looking at it. And... I knew enough that this is something new, and what it was, it was the expressions of the algorithms that gives you the hypothesis where you can test the theorems of field containment. That simple. So anyway, I was going, well, this is kind of cool. So I thought, how am I ever going to build something like this? It'd take a miracle to have that, the kind of equipment materials and people I would need to build it. It's not something you're going to go build in the garage, okay? It's not like Apple computer. It's a little bit more complex. So this is where the rest of the story starts. My mother, uh, my dad was injured, and my mother had to go to work, uh, back to work at age 40. And um, <laughs> as brilliant Stanton Freeman said, my mother was some kind of caregiver. Uh, no, Stanton, it wasn't. Uh, my mother was a registered LPN. And in 1966, she became one of the first females in the state of Ohio to command a CCU unit. We just built them, coronary care units. 1966, they just invented. My mother's running one. So she takes a graveyard shift, 11 at night to 7 in the morning. She loved that shift. And 
she had a 93-year-old patient named Irving LeMay. And the cranky old man knocked one of her nurses out with a cane. She went in there and broke the cane next to his head. I will beat you to death if you touch another nurse. He became real friendly. And uh, <laughs> so the son showed up. And the son wanted to see his dad. Got to go through my mother to see the dad. The son would come in about 3 o'clock in the morning because he's got a paparazzi problem. His name is Curtis LeMay. Four-star General Curtis LeMay, chief of the Joint Chiefs. There's nobody higher than the, other than the president, who was John Kennedy. So he got to know my mother. Miracle happened. And he asked my mother a simple question. She wanted to get to know him. And How's, what kind of family you got? Got three sons. First two is okay. The third one's odd. You got to watch him. <laughs> Matter of fact, we moved him out of the basement of the house to another garage that's out by itself because my dad, my husband was afraid he was going to launch us. What? Going to launch the entire house? What's he doing? He's launching cow, you know, these rockets out in cow fields. And um, maybe I should tell you that part of the story. It's, it's now the year 1966. What came out on TV in the fall of 66? Star Trek. Would you believe what luck, the four farms that were around us, they were all trackers. These farmers were, they're crazy about Star Trek. I thought, how cool is that? So they said, I told them, could I launch rockets? Rockets? Hell yeah, boy, you can launch rockets. So, 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 so they were very helpful. They got the front end loaders and went out and they dug this big earth pit. Big enough where I could drive the car down in, the station wagon, haul the rockets down in there. I had a subterranean launch area. And all the cows, they raised cattle. Really cool cows. I really liked them. Uh, they'd all get up, and I'd be down there working, look up, and cows are all the way around the perimeter and all looking down at me, chewing. <laughs> and the cows are smart. Cows are very smart. I like cows. They see me come up out of the pit slowly. They all turn around and walk real slow. And they get about 100 yards back, and they, they're waiting for this thing to come out of the pit. And they just, all, you know, all these heads looking up, chewing. <laughs> and I, that was no, that's a normal day. And, um, but if they ever saw me run out of the pit, they ran, stampede, they'd run, because something blows up out of the pit. And, um, and believe me, that I had way more accidents than I had successes. They were smart putting me underground because it could blow up stuff, shrapnel fly everywhere, and the cows were okay. But, um, except one day, um, I decided to build a cryogenic staging rocket. Now, liquid fuel engines on staging is very complex. It took NASA 45 years to figure it out. Soviet Union never did figure it out. It's very complex. And I learned my lesson the first day. The rocket comes out of the pit. Well, right when it gets to the event horizon, the opening of the pit, the second, the second stage ignites, blows the first stage back into the pit. It explodes. This is all in a split second. Ball fire comes back up and concussion turns the rocket sideways. And it's now horizontal going across the landscape like a torpedo heading for a fleet of cows. <laughs> the cows know this is not normal. And it's coming at them and I just, I was standing there and I was just screaming, God save me, save the cows, save the cows. So the rocket bounced twice, hits the ground and rams in and locks in. The engine's still running, the vibration, fuel tanks rupture, explodes. It's full of liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen and it, it if you don't know about hydrogen, it's one of the best fuels you could ever use in a jetliner, which we don't. But um, the fuel has to get 20 feet above the ground before it gets enough barometric pressure where it can detonate. So if you were in a plane crash, the fuel would burn above you, not on you. Nuts. They won't do it. So anyway, the ca under the big fireball now is about the size of the ballroom in this place. I'm looking under and the cows are looking at me and they've got eyes like this. <laughs> and I thought, oh God, here we go. It was like an army, just all of them in unison, turn, about face, stampede. 
and they go off, and I thought, well, that's, they're going to run and be okay. But there's a cow on the far side that's looking the other way and don't see anything. And the stampede goes right over that cow. So I come running over that cow. It's all busted up. It's dead. I mean, it, 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 organs hanging out. So, and I went, God, I killed this cow. And farmers are now coming from all four farms, from all four directions. They come over there because they knew that was not normal. And um, you okay, David? I'm fine, but I killed your cow. You know, and I'm crying because I'm, I'm going to lose my launch area. And um, it's 90 degrees, and they're, they're looking at it going, um, we're not going to have time to um, get to the butcher shop, but this, these are Angus cows, a lot of money. That's a 2,000-pound cow laying there. So they pick it up with a front-end loader, and they go to the barn, and they tell me, come with them, i got to go to the barn. And I thought, gee whiz, this is going to be interesting. Um, I get there, and they string this poor cow up by the neck with a chain hoist, and they tell me, um, you got to dress this cow. And I turn around and I look at him going, why in God's name would I want to put a dress on this dead cow? <laughs> and they just bust out laughing, tobacco juice going everywhere. And the <laughs> guy behind me went, here. And I cut that cow. It was just, I became a vegetarian. It was just, <laughs> but I also had charts. And, uh, and the wives came out. And I, I cut this cow and I cut it to the charts. And I just want to do such a perfect job. And the guys are here mumbling back there, God almighty, he cuts like a surgeon. That's way better than the meat house does. And I cut this all 2,000 pounds up. And um, the, the wives were wrapping it. And I thought, they're going to throw me out now. My dad pulls up. And I thought, it's just going from bad to worse. <laughs> and um, he looks up. And they stop and talk to him. And, and they're all laughing. And um, uh, I didn't tell you about the part where uh, I had everything up to my knees coming out of this cow. And it's hot. And I'm scraping. I'm cutting everything out. And it's up to my shoulders. And this guy puts a bag of, of uh, big league chew in my face. Here, have a chaw, boy. I just, it, it, it was awful. So anyway, they, my dad walks up and said, um, well, they're not going to throw you off your property. As a matter of fact, you really did them a favor. They were going to uh, have this cow butchered, and you just saved them around $400. They're pretty happy with you. I said, really? How about you? And he goes, I just got 50 pounds of steaks. I'm really happy. <laughs> so I never ate a single steak. So um, I don't want to get distracted, but this is all, le this is all going somewhere. <laughs> So what I'm establishing is how I got a launch pit, how I could build so sophisticated rockets, how I got to things that seemed way too complicated. And now another string of events happened. Um, did you know General Curtis LeMay ran for vice president of the United States in 1968 on an independent ticket with the presidential candidate of George Wallace? Did you know that? Remember that? Some of you? Yeah. Well, well, George gets shot. Had good, <laughs> he deserved it. But anyway, <laughs> that meant LeMay, see what, um, I'm going to back up again here. LeMay was arguing with North Vietnam. This is 1968. Tech offensive, really bad. Anyway, he tells North Korea, if you don't get your butts over to Paris peace talk table, I'm going to bomb you back into the Stone Age. Do you remember that? That was quoted in international papers. Next day, he's fired by the Secretary of Defense, McNamara. Okay. If you ever seen a picture of Curtis LeMay at that time, he's like 59 years old, standing there with that big stogie. Does this look like a guy that's going to retire? I don't think so. He was running for vice president because he's not through. He has an agenda he's running. Well, Wallace gets shot. That was the election, lost the election, November 68. January 6, 1969, there's a knock on my front door. I open the door, and there stands a full bird colonel in uniform. He goes, hi, my name is Colonel Arthur Bailey Williams. I'm XO for General LeMay. I went, okay, what can I do for you? Uh, we need to talk. LeMay switched gears when all that happened because, let me tell you something about LeMay. You, the B-52 Stratofortress, the nuclear bomber, LeMay designed it, created it. 
And then he wanted to use it, so he created SAC, Strategic Air Command, Nuclear Deterrent Forces. He created a, he did all that before he got fired. So he had another plane he was going to replace the B-52, which by the way, the B-52 is still in service over 70 years. The longest running military aircraft design in world history. This is the guy that made it. And now he just told me, I'm going to be your project manager. <laughs> what are we building, General? He said, you're going to build your rocket, son. And I don't, just write out your wish list because we're going to fill it out and we're going to go to work. Because what he, at that time, there were two of them built. How many people heard of the XB-70? Valkyrie. Yes, these hands go up. Type it in the internet. You're not going to believe what this thing looks like. It's a Delta wing with a big long nose and a cockpit. A Delta wing. The Delta wing's almost the size of a football field. It carries nuclear weapons. It's going to replace the B-52. And they built two of them. They cruise at 85,000 feet and cruise at 2,000 miles an hour. Designed in 1958. Where do you think some of these ideas are coming from? We have nothing today that can touch that thing. Nothing. Nothing in the sky can fly that high or that fast. One of them was destroyed in a test. We didn't know that giant wings back there, and the way they curved down at the, at the pin yards, created tornadoes that you couldn't see. And a camera jet came up behind it and was pulled in and went into the engines and blew the whole left wing off. And the thing went to the ground, crashed, blew up, killed the crew. There's only one left. So they then put it, they're looking at it going, this is the last one of its kind. So they put it over to um, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, Dayton, Ohio. The Air Force Museum is sitting in a building. You can go look at it. it what the plan was, he was going to get 45 of these things built, this Valkyrie, replace the B-52s, put them up in the constant orbit of uh, Strategic Air Command at Failsafe, and then he was going to drop all the missiles and stuff out of it and put Pithlum, that's my rocket engine, in it. And then he was going to launch onto the Soviet Union. So your bomber comes in at 2,000 miles an hour, and then they open the bay and drop Pithlum. Now Pithlum, I'm jumping ahead, but remember that whole scenario, okay? Kind of like Pulp Fiction. Now let me take you back to something else. <laughs> Now we're back to me working with Colonel Williams, and we started, and there was a big uh, commercial garage that came with the property my parents bought with their house. It was closed down, but you, you know how big a commercial, you know, like a Buick dealership in the big garage? That's what it was, and it was empty, and that became my new home. Uh, I got a shower and a bathroom built and a bedroom, uh, and the rest of it was completely remodified by courtesy of the United States Air Force. And I had a list this long I gave them. I thought, I'll never get this stuff. I got everything. I got presses, rollers. I've got spectrometers. I've got, I have a major lab. And what we did, we painted all the windows black. And uh, they built this fake wall that could roll back and forth. And sitting back there was this giant lab. And then the Air Force people showed up. And I told Colonel Williams, you got to get them guys in blue jeans and plaid shirts. You can't have uniforms running around with all the medals and stars and stuff. So I'm trying to live a normal life here. And um, I am a ripe old age of 13. So <laughs> they put on their clothes, and we all start to work, and we go to work on this project. And, um, but it wasn't long until somebody else got involved, a United States congressman of my area named Congressman John Ashbrook who ran for uh, President of the United States in 1972. Anyway, he is, you know, what his, you know what his job was in Congress? He's chief of internal security of Congress. Imagine the power he has. So he walks up and asks me what's going on and knows the general's doing something out here. And the thing that caught his attention was, I answered the phone one day, LeMay called me and he heard you heard the women up the line. It's a party line. Bobby, you don't even know what that is, do you? Yes. Some of you do. A party line is where lots of families share the same phone line. Yes. No. Yes. So the general's online talking to me, and he started, he said, who's that laughing? 
I said, you got somebody with you? I said, no, there's a the party line. It's a party line? Click. <laughs> Next morning, all these telephone poles and trucks show up. And they restrain an entire telephone system into my house. And that's when the congressman said, what is going on out there in, in, you know, in Knox County? So um, he found out. And so he started talking to LeMay. And LeMay and them got together. And uh, here's the other crazy thing. Thanks to LeMay. Now, LeMay is retired, right? He got fired. It doesn't matter he's in civilian clothes. He walks onto a military base. This is the, the former chief of the Joint Chief. This is Bombs Away LeMay. That was his nickname. <laughs> and he has a big cigar. And like he was on a flight line with all these B-52s being refueled. And the fuel's like, you know, inch deep. He's walking across it, smoking a cigar. And a little lieutenant comes up. General, you can't smoke. You might have a fire. These planes might catch fire. And he turned around and said, they wouldn't dare. <laughs> And it, that's, do you remember the story of LeMay and, um, and the senator that he chewed out so bad? Oh, God, what's his name? Um, he asked him the question, what, Goldwater. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, anyway, Barry Goldwater, Senator Barry, very powerful senator, asked LeMay, and I, I got, LeMay was with me two hours after he talked to Barry Goldwater. And you're to see what Barry Goldwater said. I asked the general, tell me about Hangar 17 and Area 51. And LeMay turns around, grabs him by his tie and says, don't you ever ask me that question ever again. And pushed him back. That's a full-blown United States senior senator. He, he was laughing because he said, I think LeMay would have stomped me into the ground. So why did he react like that? Stuff's going on, y'all. But he has a different agenda at that moment, and it involves this teenager. So we, we start building, start construction, and I, you should see the parts and materials. And the, they would destroy the uh, paper trails. They destroyed every hour of the day. They erased things off of containers, but I was, there, I was ahead of them. I could actually catch some of this stuff. And... We had groups like Lawrence, National Lawrence Livermore Laboratories. We had RAN. We had Batero Memorial. Uh, we had um, Los Alamosas. Tennessee, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Everybody's involved in this. It's coming through a thing called the Iron Triangle. You've heard of that? No? That's your military, industrial, and commercial complexes working together. It's what's fueling everything you're all concerned about. It's, what, it's the driving mechanism, and it's still in place. LeMay commands that, commands it. And so I have carte blanche for everything I want. Gee, uh, General, I, I, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I need about, a, about three grams of plutonium-238. No problem. Be here tomorrow morning. It was. So all this stuff was kind of, That's how this all could happen. So... You wish you see the lab by now. And it, it just keeps getting weirder. If it ain't weird enough. I ran into so many construction problems because it's just the things that the math would tell you, specs that we're doing, things aren't going to work. Let me give you an example. LeMay, I asked LeMay, what's the biggest, baddest, strongest rocket in the U.S. arsenal fleets? And he said, well, that'd be the Titan missile, ICBM. And I said, um, he said, why? I said, well, I need one. Okay. So, <laughs> now it sounds like BS, right? However, you go to Ashland, Ohio, which in my, um, I have a DVD I made. In Ashland, Ohio is Ashland College, home of John Ashbrook's library. And the curator's there. And we walked in with the producer and said, can we see the letters we talked about? He spins a big wheel in the vault and opens up, and out comes this tray of letters, and they lay a letter down. And my producer's looking at it, and she goes, are you serious? The letter says, uh, Dear David, it's from Congress of the United States. 
says, Dear David, uh, John Ashbrook is running for the president. He's out of the office. But in the meantime, we're in the process of obtaining you the Titan missile. <laughs> and I told the producer, look at the date. June 10th, 1970. I was born in 1954. How old am I? I'm 15. You're handing a Titan missile that's 130 feet tall. It takes a full military escort to move it around. It weighs about three, let's see, would depend on the two engines that were in it, half million pound thrusting engines. This is a major piece of hardware, and you're giving it to a 15-year-old, a state-of-the-art ICBM missile, signed by Congress, stamped by the security of Congress. In this vault, how do you Photoshop that? The producer's looking at it going, name of God. I said, well, you like that? Look at the other 13 letters behind it. And the whole story I've been telling you, it's all right there. In the Library of Congress. You know why? John Ashbrook was murdered. He was killed by the next person entering his story. Anybody heard of anybody named Arthur Rudolph? It's an honorary title, Dr. Arthur Rudolph. He came in with... Operation Paperclip. He was one of the chief architects of the B-2 rocket. He's also a full colonel in the Gestapo. He's also a winner of the Most Distinguished Service Award by NASA because he's your chief architect of the F-1 Apollo Saturn V moon rocket engines. They didn't want to tell you that, do they? And they didn't really want you to know. Why? Because on... Um, January 24th in 1984, no, May 24th, 1984, very quietly, he was shipped out of San Francisco to Munich, Germany, house arrest for the rest of his life for war crimes because he killed 100,000 prisoners building the V-2 rockets. That's your winner, the Distinguished Service Award by NASA. And it's all history, it's all facts, and it's all laying in the internet. This guy got on my case, and it was bad. And um, so we get Pistolum done, and I remember laying the night before we were going to ship it out, and um, the fire, I had a fireplace, and the light was shining off the hull of it. This thing was so amazing looking. Um, anyway, back to that big ICBM. Um, I told General May it's not going to work. Look at the numbers. And he goes, what's going to happen? And I take this styrofoam cup and I go, Phew. that's what's going to happen to your rocket when this engine goes off. Let me ask it another way. What goes through, General, a mosquito's mind when it hits the windshield 80 miles an hour? His butt. <laughs> so the general, go, general actually, cigar fell out of his mouth. That's what's going to happen when this engine turns on. It's going to rip clear through your rocket because the acceleration curve on this thing, I can't even get a calculator to go that high. And he said, what are we going to do? We're going to lay the engine down and build a rocket around it. And that's exactly what we did. Now, I remember I was on Art Bell and I was describing this, and the material I used on this rocket, I don't know where it came from. It came from England, but the origin of the metal is unknown. There was enough of it to build a rocket. There was tons of it. And it's, it, it's got a really cool name. It's, it's um, carbonite. And the minute I said that, all the experts that's listening, Art Bell wrote in, oh, he's, that's what Han Solo was frozen in, carbonite. Yeah, this guy's a liar. C-A-R-B-O-N-I-T-E, carbonite. That's Han Solo. Mine is C-A-R-B-N-I-T-E, carbonite. It is so hard. You ever saw molten metal poured into these big vats? Well, those vats are made out of a material called Incarnel. This stuff is about 10,000 times stronger than Incarnel. And we don't know where it came from. But there's just enough where we can build a body around this rocket. And here's the craziest part. When it's all completely finished, the surface cohesion tension of this material looks like water wet. It's that shiny. So Pitham was laying there, and it was stretched out down through the 
room and this fireplace was shining off of it and I was laying on the bed looking at it and thinking, God, I can't believe I built this thing. Took us 26 months, three weeks and two days and it's completed. So what does my beautiful rocket goes into? It goes into a semi that has Piggly Wiggly painted on the side of it. <laughs> you gotta love the Air Force. We went from Mount Liberty, Ohio to Wright Paris Air Force Base and we pulled up and there's a C-141 Starlifter. You're to see that th huge jet. Four engines, big cargo bay. I mean, you drive army tanks in it. And there's a ring of guards all the way around it with all these weapons and stuff. And I was afraid to walk up to the guards. And LeMay said, son, they belong to you. They're protecting you and your rocket. It's okay to walk through. I said, really? Wow. So we load the rocket on and we take off and we go to uh, New, White, uh, New Mexico to White Sands Missile Proving Grounds. It's not called it anymore, but back then it was. So anyway, we get to test sites, we get everything set up, and Colonel Williams with me you know, the whole way, and um, I'm, I'm looking at it, we're getting it prepped for the next morning, and somebody said, uh, Colonel, you better look at what's coming in, and this black DC-9 coming into the runway. And I went, wow, where's the white bunny head? Back in that time, Hugh Hefner had a black DC-9 jet that had a white bunny head on it. <laughs> so I looked at Colonel Williams, he ain't smiling. He's just like really concerned. Thing pulls up, door comes down, out comes all these guys, I swear to God, black suits, mirrors, sunglasses. And then this one little guy with gray hair and khaki shorts, I thought, well, he's the only one dressed for this place. He's behind him, he comes out, but I recognize him because Von Braun, that's another story, I just can't go, it's so long. Um, Von Braun showed me a picture of him and he said, if he ever shows up, David, you are in such trouble. And it's Arthur Rudolph. So he comes out of there, he walks over to me, he said, oh, are you the young man that has the rocket? And you know, it's German, blonde hair, blue eyes. I'm waiting for him to say, we have ways of getting the way you to talk. So, and he's hold, so help me holding a, cig a cigarette like this. And I'm going, if that's not a, if that's not Nazi, I don't know what that is. So we walk over to the, to Pithlum Lane there and I'm on one side of it. He's on the other. And I, he said, open it up. Let me look at the engine. Sure. So pull out this bar of metal and I slide it down the hull. What was no seam, all of a sudden there's a seam and the door rises up and slides to the side. He goes, what? What is that? I went, it's called a dissimilar metal lock. You ever heard of them? That's the key, the block of metal. And he's like looking at me like I'm from another planet. I said, it's old technology. It was made in World War II. He was upset. But anyway, he stuck, <laughs> he stuck his head down in the engine compartment. And I thought, I just can't stand it. I'm going to do something. So I got right over top of his head and I got right down by his ear and I go, that engine you're looking at has 10,000 times the power of all five of F1 Saturn engines of follow. What do you think of that, Dr. Rudolph? <laughs> and his head springs up, man, he's about the color of a thermometer. And he's, <laughs> he's looking at me, he goes, how did you, how? He's so upset he can't even get his questions out. And I thought, I guess he's a little angry. He thought the Germans were so far ahead and here the, and I asked him, who are you? And he told me, I'm a man who just looks at things for the government. He asked, who are you? I'm just a kid that launches ca uh, rockets and cow fields. <laughs> and it went downhill from there. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't good encounter. So now, so now, um, we, we pack the rocket up, take it out to the platform, get it ready to launch. Rudolph comes out all huffed and tells me to change the coordinates to these coordinates. And I'm going, wait a minute, I can bring this thing so good. I'm so good at this. I can bring this thing down within a mile radius. We want to walk anywhere to get this thing. You want me to drop it 456.4 miles northwest of here? And so I grab a map and I went, that's in the middle of a dry lake bed called Groom Lake. Why in God's name you want to drop something there? Do it. And so I did. 
So I go to tell Colonel Williams, can't find Colonel Williams. He's been house arrested. And I went, oh, this is, oh, God, this is just, Von Braun said this is going to go bad. So, um, well, actually, I jumped something, launch. I'm trying to save time. Man, the launch, you should see the launch on this thing. You understand what's happening. This is not solid fuel. It's not liquid fuel. This is a different kind of engine never seen before by man. We have no idea what it's going to look like, how it's going to perform. And I kept telling them, wait till you hear it. It's, it's not going to be, it's going to be something else. Because the, the calculations are like here. But in reality, when we finally got it done, the calculations I thought was curved like this. The curve was through the ceiling. I missed it a little bit. Um, I'm sorry, I just don't have the brains for it. It was just more than I was expecting. But anyhow, I, I don't want to skip this part because Colonel Williams was so cool about this. The, we got the rocket on the pad. Everybody's gone. And now it's June 20th, 1971. And on Art Bell, an old timer from White Sands called in and said, I was there that day. He's right. It was the only day the entire White Sands range was shut down and everybody was told to stay in the buildings. Because I, I said that. I said, I don't know what this thing's going to do. I was afraid about something else, and it wouldn't matter if you're in a building. It just, <laughs> it, um, if the containment fields didn't hold, we're going to be only a mile and a half from the sun, a real sun sitting there. So they they put the telemetry, everything winds up, the cyclotrons are firing, everything's starting to detonate, and now it moves to what we call internal power, meaning that the rocket is now separated from us. It's on its own, and we can't do nothing about it. So Colonel Williams is looking out the windows of the blockhouse, and he <laughs> what a time to ask. David, when did you test the fields? We've been working day and night, seven days a week for the last 26 months, three weeks. Two days. When have I had time to test the field? This is the test. <laughs> and he goes, I could tell he was, he's a very smart man. And he's looking, he goes, what? Well, if they don't, if the fields don't hold, do this. I did a jumping jack. He goes, why? Look at the flat wall, make a really cool shadow. <laughs> and he goes, oh God. And he hits the red button and tries to shut it off and it won't shut down. It's now internal power. He said, what, what do you think is going to happen? It's either going to launch or we're going to make some really cool shadows. <laughs> he goes, oh, God, hit the button again. And too late. All of a sudden, everything in the building's moving because the, 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 vibr the cyclotrons that are hammering out there. So all of a sudden, we see a light. And it starts out bright. It starts out bright. But it goes a whole lot brighter. It starts growing intensity. It's getting so bright, everybody puts their glasses on. It keeps getting brighter. It will get up to one million candle power per square inch. That's the sun. And I have the, at the bottom of the rocket, I have the fields extending out below the rocket so I don't burn the tail's fins off. And it, there's just a massive explosion. This, it's gone as a white streak. And this blast ring coming. And they went, what's that? It's a concussion wave. And it hits us. And I look out, and these poor security guards, the only people out there, they're hanging on the cars. They look like flags in the wind. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, God. And um, so anyway, the rocket is gone. And the only thing we heard was, uh, you can't unhear this. It's... Um, I don't even know how to describe it. Screaming angels with a, with a vibrato wave and a uh, Doppler effect. It was terrifying. I looked at one of the technicians. Well, he's under a table. He was just terrified. And I said, you know, the sound's not going to get you. It'd be the exhaust. But anyway, it, the containment field. Matter of fact, that's what the technician looked like. <laughs> he just did a nosedive. So anyway... Um, let me type. There we go. So anyway, um, they said, damn, it blew up. And I went, I'm looking at this white streak, and it's going in, out of sight into a blue sky. I said, it didn't detonate. It left. 
And Colonel Williams, what are you talking about? You ever try to see a rifle bullet leave a barrel? That's how fast this thing, three tons? It's got two speeds, off and wide open. I don't know how to throttle it. And red phone rings, and that's NORAD. And they're, he, Colonel Williams, God, now what? So he picked it up. You could hear this guy like he's on speakerphone. What in God's name did you do out there? Something is, has left your base. Yeah, uh, civilian rocket blew up. Blew up? Hell, it's, it's at Mach 37. <laughs> and how high? It's 126 miles. And it's now shut off. And that's the, I was shooting for 125. And at that apogee point, um, it's going to curve. It's going to glide all the way to where it's supposed to go, Groom Lake. So they said on the phone, do you know where it's heading? Yeah, we do. Well, that's good because you're going to have to talk to them people. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I looked at the map and I said, where are we going? We're going to go see your rocket. What? you got a DC-9. It's got rubber tires. That's a dry lake bed. You're going to belly up to the belly on this thing. Shut up and get on a plane. So we get on a plane. And, um, and then Colonel Williams was detained. He was moved away and locked in his quarters. And I thought, man, I'm, and I realized I'm being kidnapped. So off we go. Just me and the guys in black suits and Rudolph. We land, we fly over and we land. And um, a lot of people say, well, he's lying because he didn't have the base built. I just don't go into all the details. There's just so many details, y'all. For those nose pickers, I will tell them this. We flew over, lots of construction, lots of chalk and tape and ribbons everywhere. Clearly, two big runways are going to be built, about 10,000 foot each, two of them. And we land on a taxiway that cuts across. And we roll up to a center hangar, and you get out, and the hangars look old. They're painted where they look old, but you get close to them, it's brand new. Now, why would they want them painted old? Satellites watching, I guess. And I thought, what is... What is with all this stuff? So um, then you think the story's weird? It's just starting. First thing, this thing pulls up. It looks like a golf cart, but it's not a golf cart. It's got some kind of intake in the center that, you know, it pulsates and glows. Makes a strange sound. I swear I never heard anything whine like that. And you get on it, and we took off, and... It, I, I'm trying to figure out how this golf cart's running. And we go in the center hangar, we sit there, and then all these chains come up out of the floor, doors close off, lights come on. And I thought, what next? And the floor is the size of a football field. It's concrete. It drops. All of it. It's an elevator. And I'm going, holy smokes, you can put three or four 747s in here and drop them. Whatever they're picking up and down, just a concrete floor has got to be 500,000 pounds. It can't be pulleys or chains or cables. What is lifting this thing? So as we're going down, I found out embedded in the walls where half of, them would half of their bodies would stick out were 12 sequoia size worm screws. That's the heaviest lifting load. Your garage door. That's a worm screw. Very heavy load capacity. Strongest thing we know of. So whatever's going up and down this elevator is unbelievably heavy, like an aircraft carrier. So the floor goes down. We sit there and ride, and I'm counting, listening to the clicks, figuring out how many feet we're going down. They thought I was seasick or something. I thought, yeah, they don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so we go down about 205 feet, and the floor levels out. And you look straight out ahead, and I'm going, you got to be kidding. There's this arc-shaped cavern that is so far it's bending with the curvature of the earth and you cannot see the end of it. And I'm going, man, this is big. So the first thing I blurt out is a good normal question. What would you do with all the dirt? And <laughs> they got furious over that question. And I'm going, I, I, just, I just smiled, never mind. And so we're riding down through the hallways, 
of the causeway. And there's shops, labs, other hangars, sliding doors, other aircraft in there. Uh, the XB-70 was sitting down there. That's all it. Or something that looked like it because at that time, 71, the other one's sitting in the um, Air Force Museum. So I don't know what that was, but it looked like the XB-70, but it was huge. Anyway, there was other aircraft and then there was a couple of things sitting there that looked like teardrops with landing gears. And these are not models because they got air conditioner hoses hooked to them, power units, and drip pans. These are working aircraft or spacecraft, or whatever they are. Um, and there was another thing really cool. I was an Irvin Allen fan of uh, Voyage Bottom of the Sea. Remember the flying sub? One of them suckers was sitting over there. And I'm going, wow, man, they got the flying sub. And they got on the radio and they closed the door. <laughs> but we're riding on down. We go for a good ways. We stop to the left. And there's this, it's not like the other hangar doors where they slide. You know what a, an iris of a camera looks like? This iris has got to be about 40 feet in diameter. It's made of some kind of armor. And I thought, whoa, man, that's a serious door. It must be something good behind that. And we're going in it. The guy jumps out, looks at this thing, flashes the screen. He's got his hands in the, on the panels. And it opens up. And I went, did I just see a retinal scanner and a palm scanner? This is 1971. We don't even have handheld calculators yet. That comes a few years later. You know, that was back in the years where we had digital watches where you had to use two hands, one to press the little button. Thing cost about $1,000. Today you buy it for $1.99 at Walmart. So they got some serious technology, but here's the craziest thing. As we're driving down through the causeway, all these rooms and stuff, perfectly lit, but no shadows. How do you light a room up with no shadows? And then I went, where's the light fixtures? It's not indirect lighting like this is, or direct lighting. It's illumination. And the only thing I can figure, maybe the atmosphere. So, maybe. I don't know. I'll be the first time, I don't know. And uh, I, I thought, this is crazy, man. And a retina scanner, and a I said, man, this place is just freaking me out. So... We walk, we drive into the room, the lights come up, no light fixtures. Okay, this is normal. So what do you want to show me? And on the far end of the room, the room's about the size of a gymnasium. There's a big stage there with made of iron girders and stuff, whatever it is, pretty heavy. And there's curtains, and I ain't talking about curtains that look like this. You ever seen mud flap curtains on a semi? You ever try to pick one of them up? They weigh over 100 pounds. These curtains probably weighed seven or eight tons. They were huge. And they were all the way around, they had chains to them, and the chains would hoist the thing up in the ceiling. So we get out of the cart, they hoist the big curtains up. This is not something you're gonna run in and take a peek. So it comes up and I'm sitting there going, oh shoot, I thought I was ahead of everybody because my engine's about this big, electromagnetic fusion containment engine. This thing's the size of a semi, 75 feet. That, I've measured this room. It's about 30 feet longer than this room. 75 feet, 22 feet wide, 15 feet high. And the way I could tell the difference, because I was allowed to look at it, and when I walked, I measured it with my feet. It's huge, and it's a, I can tell. I had a, a four-cylinder Model A engine, they had a Lamborghini. And, but then I got closer and looked at it, and I realized um, there's something wrong with this thing. I have miles of wiring on mine, Mol seal, all the weld seam stuff. As big as this thing is, not one bolt, not one rivet, not one screw, not one weld line, not one seam. It looked like it grew like an eggplant. I'll find out later I was pretty close to Mark. This is a machine. And I looked at it and I said, it's, it's more than a machine. I'm not building a rocket engine. The rocket engine, God, there's so many people. I didn't tell you about the other part. Um, I am building a power plant, a different kind of nuclear power plant, okay? 
the they some people ask me, well, how did you how did you validate the theorems? I said, rocket engine. And he went, oh, God, how smart. I said, I, no, how desperate. That's the only thing I could come up with. So that's how I could f find out if I'm right on the containment fields. Now, my containment field is only held for 4.5 seconds. Pislum only flew for three seconds, but look at the speed and distance that it did. Imagine if it kept running. It went just two more seconds. It would have went over 25,000 miles an hour. It's already over that. It would have broke the gravity field and went into space and gone forever. I kind of wish it had done that because it's going to be bad what happens next. So anyhow, my rocket is laying up on the desert floor. We're down underneath it with this system. And I'm looking at it, and I turn to Rudolph. Can I get closer to it? Air Force people said no. He turns yes. So now we know who's running the show, don't we? So I, I go on up on the stage, went up steps, got close to this thing. And I'm looking, it is just such, you should just see this thing. I mean, you, you can tell this is not a product of our 20th century industrial process. This is something else, y'all. And um, so I put my hands on it. But bef as I'm reaching out to it, I went, there's my shadow. Hey, shadows, where's the lights? So I moved my sh hand, shadows a split second behind me. And I'm going, oh, heat-seeking recognition alloy. Okay, I can follow that. That's what I thought it was, but it's something else. So I put my hands flat on it and pull myself up. It has an ectoskeleton structure. Its skeleton's on the outside. On the inside is a very smooth surface. And I used to, um, at that time, I was lucky. I got to play with dolphins. And so when I went to feel the surface of the thing, it feels like a dolphin skin. And it feels soft, organic, but it's hard as steel. And I'm going, how can it be both at the same time? And wherever my hand is laying flat on it, that's something you got to see. There's an energy band that comes out and dissipates down the hull and finally fades. But it's wherever your flesh is touching it, it's reacting to you. And I'm going, wow, that's really cool. I'm like, how did it? And finally, Rudolph told me, go on up. So I crawled up the skeleton structure, got up on top, and what looks like a big spinal column with vertebrates, I'm stepping over it. And I look in the vertebrates, and there's all these tubes running through the ectoskeleton structure. And you can see a liquid moving through the tubes, and the liquid looks like uh, methylate in the sun. Y'all remember methylate yeah. in mercurochrome? A lot of these young people going, what is he talking about? <laughs> what I'm talking about is when you saw that, saw your mom coming with that, you're going to go, God, this is going to be good. They put on cuts, burn like fire, but never got infected, though, did you? <laughs> Killed everything, nuked the whole area. So anyway, um, <laughs> um, that's, what, that's what this fluid looked like. And it's, it's iridescent. And it's like glowing. I'm going, and it's moving. I went, and it's cold in that room, like air conditioning. And you put your hands all, all over the thing, and it's warm. Same temperature as us. And I'm looking around. There's no power cords. None. How is this staying warm? How is this fluid moving? And there's no power. And I'm going, has this thing got an internal power source? And I thought, when I built mine, I didn't have a secondary power source like that. So anyway, I'm walking up to the front because, how do you describe this thing? I've been trying to get, I've been trying to get, concept artists to work with me and it's <laughs> proven to be difficult trying to it's like I'm describing to a police artist what this, the assailant looked like and the best way I can describe it for you think of two octopuses having sex <laughs> you have two big round bulbs type look with all the tentacles twisted around that is where the psychotrons are firing the the tentacles are the plasma ducts and it's in a figure eight pattern and that's, that's what makes this thing work. That's why they haven't gotten it right yet. So anyway, I'm looking at that. And um, I get down to the damage area. There's a hole about four feet in diameter inside. Something has come in and hit it. And it hit it in the exact right place. Because figure eight, 
right where the two balls cross. I call that the eye of the hurricane. That's where the force of the plasmas are going through. You've got to remember there's 100 million degrees temperature running in this thing at this place. And uh, that's 100 million degrees centigrade. It's even hotter in Fahrenheit. So anyhow, I'm looking at it and I went, wow. And I could look down in the damaged hole and where the blast area was, it didn't blow from the inside out. It blew from the in outside in. So something hit it, and um, this is metal, right? So it should be very sharp and jagged. You know what it looks like? It looks like a whale that's been sharp with a harpoon, which has a grenade on the end of it, and blows a hole in the whale. That's how they kill them with harpoon guns. And if you ever look at a hole of a whale that's been blown by a, a charge, that's exactly what this hole looked like. And I'm going... I'm standing on a dead whale? I mean, is this thing organic or inorganic? Is it a machine or something else? And I, I'm a little confused. So anyway, I slide down to the damaged area and I grab hold of the, the blown out chunks. You could hang on to it. It was really hard, but the blast made it look like it was like flesh. I, I, I can't describe it any clearer. So anyway, I go down into the dark part. And it's glowing down there. So I asked Rudolph, can I look inside? Air Force people, no. Yeah, go ahead. So I go on down in there. And, um, and man, let me tell you. What I saw where that damage area is, you've got to think about something. Um, I'll eventually figure this mechanism out here. There we go. I got it. Um, I'm a rocket scientist. Of course I can figure this out. <laughs> so I get down in there, and the first thing I noticed was what was left of a seat is gone, but you can sit down, your legs would hang over. And I'm going, that is a bipedaled anthropoid shape. So that's whoever it's working at. This is a maintenance station. It's a, that's what it is. It's a diagnostic station. Because on the other side, there's one that hasn't been damaged. And this is twins, left and right. One for the front, one for the back. And that's the way I built mine, but not big enough for somebody to sit down in. Mine's only this big. Now I'm able to walk through my engine. You, you, got, you got to be in here to let that was freaked out. I have had stuff so small, I'd have to assemble it under a microscope. Now I'm big enough, I can walk through it. And I'm going, man, this is just too much. So I'm getting down there, and I sit down what's left of this seat, and the blast that came in was amazing. It came through the walls and through the uh, diagnostic area, disintegrating everything that it hit. It cut through the seat, and then it hit the bulkhead where the plasma walls are, where the electromagnetic fusion containment fields are. And it stopped. Yeah, when it hit that field, it stopped it. I don't care what the heck they were shooting at it with. It, that blast got to right there, and it stopped at the wall. But it was enough blast to shut the thing down, and these things can stop in a picosecond. That's a trillionth of a second. So it shuts down, and I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at this was the other cool part. I could look through what looked like an observation port, and I can look up the plasma ducts. On mine, I can't do that, it's so small. And I looked up in there, and I could go for hours describing. They had these crystal looking things hanging in there, and I think they directed the plasma vents. Anyway, I remembered all this stuff because I'm gonna build this again. I'm gonna cheat this time. I'm gonna steal these designs. So I was looking at it, working with it, and um, and then there was an, another thing happened. Um, while I was sitting there, this panel slides back, and these two pods come up. They're two domes, and they got these cutouts. And if you take your hands and do like that, they fit perfect. So I put my hands in there. My mother told me, don't touch things. You don't know where they've been. <laughs> I wish I'd listened, because when I put my hands on these pods, these little shells came up going click, 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 like uh, Batman's Batmobile. Remember, it shield itself. They ran up all the way to all my knuckles, 
and they're tightening down. I didn't have any rings on at the time. And I'm going to yell for help because I think it's going to cut all 10 of my fingers off. So I started to go, eh. and then this real cool voice sounded like Lauren Bacall from, from Key West. And she, all it says is, be quiet. Okay. <laughs> and I said, lighten the grip. And it did, but it didn't let go. And I'm going, oh, God. And uh, so I'm sitting there, hello. And... Uh, it's a female voice, and she says, uh, be still. Um, this is going to be a little uncomfortable. And I went, oh, God, that's what doctors say. <laughs> you know, it means it's going to hurt like hell. <laughs> and I'm trying to get hands out, and I can't. And then it starts. is a vibration, and then you can feel the heat coming up both arms. feels like liquid fire burning. And then it gets up to here, and, brother, the light show starts. Uh, I bet my eyes were lit like a projector lens because there was this heads up viewer type thing I could see and just billions of images are going through and it is burning in my brain and it hurts. And um, so I'm sitting there going, God, I hope this is going to end quick. And then finally he said, just a little bit more. And I went, yeah, okay, it's done. And the thing, the rings back off and the panel goes dark. And everything that's in the area goes dark. And I stand up and I went, I'm leaving now. <laughs> so I get up, I crawl back out. Rudolph asked me what was going on. I felt like I was in there for about a half hour. They said I'd only been in there about four minutes. And uh, some, some, something else is going on. So I crawl up on top and I'm walking down to the other end. And then that's when all of a sudden... Um, Things started, I'm starting to say things. And I looked down at him and I said, so uh, you guys want me to help you fix your machine? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because yours look just like ours. This one's bigger. Our people working on it. Well, where are you people? Well, they're on vacation, son, like you. And I went, oh, yeah, th this, is my, uh, this is my summer of junior high school. And I'm standing there going, okay, well, did they leave any notes? Well, they have homework like you do, son. You understand? This is how they talked to you back then. You know, a teenager today would be, just wouldn't believe it. But it's very condescending. And so I said, okay. So they took their homework with them. And then finally I said, look at the construction of this thing. We didn't build this. It's not ours, and it's not theirs, meaning the Soviets. It ain't from the neighborhood, is it, y'all? Now they're getting really upset, and they said, you need to come down. I said, you need to tell the truth. I said, where is this? How old is it? Did you dig it up, or did you shoot it down? Is there an, a crew? Did you pickle them? That'd be great. Some race lands down here with packing all kinds of bad guns and stuff and pissed off and you'd pickle their crew members and I don't have anything to do with it and I get vaporized. <laughs> and they told me, get off the engine. So I come down off the engine and I am so furious because my world just crumbled in front of me. The, I went to sleep listening to Anita Bryant. I had an American flag for a blanket. And all of this is destroyed. And I'm sitting there going, this sucks. So I come down, I'm so angry. And everywhere I'm touching the hull, it's not the blue white, you know, rays or energy coming off. It is fiery orange red. Looks like methylate on fire. And I'm touching the hull and I'm going, man, what is that? And as I calm down, it calms down and goes back to blue white. And I went, oh, God, that's not heat-seeking recognition alloy. This thing is feeling me. It's reading my feelings. That means it's a sentient. This thing is alive. Or it was. And, um, and I do remember hearing this. Uh, it was time to go. We're not going to work with black hearts no more. And I'm going, what does that mean? And so I get down and talk to the Air Force, and it's, it's bad news. Nobody wants to talk to me. Everybody's pissed off. So they throw me on this um, 
back of this golf cart thing. I'm facing out back. They're driving forward. And then that's where I found out why I'm there. There's some other reason they're not telling me why I'm there. And this is it. They're whispering to each other. What happens when people whisper? You're driving forward. The wind's blowing that way. What does sound do? It travels on the air. Their whispers are right here. And I'm listening, and they're going, if we don't get, we don't get Tim to uh, tell us um, how to get this engine repaired and running, we're not going to get first strike. And I'm going, first, are they playing baseball? What, what do you mean first strike? This is 1971. Never heard of it. And then I realized, oh, God, they're talking about, then they said mad. And I went, oh, my God, it's M-A-D, Mutual Assured Destruction. It's what we live under today. It's, you're a Soviet Union, I'm America. You fire at me, I fire at you, and you can be assured we're both going to die. And so we won't shoot. The only way to play mad and win is not to play. Unless you get there first. How are you going to get there first? Your warheads are so fast. What did Pithlam just do? Set the fastest records on Earth. And now the Air Force has it laying up on the desert floor, and we're riding up there, and I just realized I've got to figure out a way to blow up my rocket engine on a top-secret military Air Force base that does not exist. So I thought, no, no pressure. <laughs> so we get up on top. I get out, and I'm looking around. And so I lean over to the hangar doors, and the big wheels in the hub is what I need. I grab a gob of graphite grease. Then I, I start screaming at Rudolph, saying, you're going to take my rocket, I won't get to see it, let me see it. Take him out there to see the rocket. Yeah, that's where I want to go. So we go out there, I'm with these two guards, and we get out there, and I tell them, stay back, it might be leaking. I open the December metal locks, and I put the graphite grease in the, in the cyclotrons, and with the residual fuel that I had in there, Ask any physicist what happens when graphite meets deuterium on a molecular level. It's a violent reaction, explosion. So I close it up, set the cyclotron for 90 seconds, and I go running back and tell them, this thing's leaking, it's going to blow up. So the guards, they don't get on the cart, so we take off, and that thing's moving along pretty good. I, I, it's, can it go any faster? And they said, well, what's a safe distance? And I didn't think about that till then. I thought, oh, God, if it goes nuclear... What's the safe distance? Chicago? <laughs> Man, that golf cart was barely hitting the floor, just streaking through. Oh and um, I was hanging on, and I really was. I thought, boy, if it goes nuclear, it ain't going to matter. Fortunately, it stayed conventional, but it blew Pithlam into so many pieces. The biggest piece they found was about the size of my thumb. So now Pithlam is gone. And I, I skipped some other things. I told, I got one phone call to my dad before we left. And way back, I told my dad, if I ever call you and I tell you you liked your pipe, I want you to take the lab and burn everything there is. Burn all the papers, burn all the drawings, burn the models, burn everything. So right before I left with Rudolph, I asked to see my dad and say, I want you to talk to him. But don't tell him where you're going. They had a 17-year-old cadaver. They were going to burn it change the dental records on it and send it to my parents and tell them I was burned to death at White Sands, New Mexico. So I'm going to be there forever. So we're standing there. Pistolin blows up. We pull up. Rudolph asks what happened. He said it was leaking. Rudolph's smart. He's, he's looking at me. He grabs my palm, looks at the hangar door, looks back and goes, very smart. And then he hits me so hard, my lower teeth go through my lip. And I'm laying on the ground, I'm bleeding, and I hear all these guns cocking, I'm going, man, it's just getting worse. And I look up, and all the gun barrels are pointed at Rudolph. These are Air Force personnel, their daddies just fought Rudolph in World War II. They ain't, it ain't over. And you just hit a Midwest Ohio kid and tore his lip up? And I went, looked up at Rudolph and said, maybe you're not so much in charge. And um, it was tense there for a minute. I was the one to say, shoot him, shoot him. <laughs> and um, the guys in black suits came out, and then it was a standoff. So black suit guys took me to a room, threw me in a room, and locked the door. No windows, just a single bulb hanging off of a wire. 
and there I sat for hours. And Rudolph told me, we're going to send a cadaver back to your parents. You're going to be here for the rest of your life. And that's when I started crying. Because I thought, man, life is over with. Nobody's going to know I'm here. And I thought, I'm just not going to give them anything. So I'm trying to figure out how to electrocute myself with that wire. I can't get to it. So after about eight or nine hours in this containment thing, I hear the biggest ruckus you ever heard. And door opens up. And there's a big square figure with a stogie. And he's got this colonel by his tie. It's the base commander. This is Curtis LeMay. He flew in. If you didn't know this, who put the commander of base in charge of Area 51? The chief of the Joint Chiefs. He did. He knows the guy. He put him there. So he's in civilian clothes. It don't matter. He's throwing this guy around like a puppet. And he saw me bleeding and... He looked at the colonel, and he started in on the colonel. And I went, it wasn't him, wasn't him, it was Rudolph. And he asked, where's Rudolph? And the colonel said, he just left before you got here. Find him. Clean him up and put him on the plane. And so the, he flew me back, and um, we went back to Wright-Patterson. Then they drove me back to my home. And that's how I spent my summer vacation my junior year in high school. Now, there's one other thing. Things were quiet in the fall, in the winter, spring. I'm graduating. I'm in high school. I'm cap and gown, shaking hands. Yeah, I'm going to Ohio State. Yes, I have a full scholarship. Astrophysics, how about that? And um, then I grabbed this hand. It's ice cold in a turn. And it's two guys in black suits and mirror sunglasses. They hand me a paper. I unfold it, and it says, greetings. I'm drafted. It's June 10th, 1972. Draft didn't shut down to 1975. They grab me in my cap and gown, drag me across the parking lot, throw me in this blue station wagon. They drive off, my parents are screaming, and all they heard was legal conscription. I can be legally taken. Now, in that DVD we have, they interview my high school classmates who say, I remember that. My God, that's what happened. He disappeared. He was gone. So um, that's what happened. Anyway, we get to the Port Columbus, Ohio, and I get on a jet. There's another confrontation. I'll skip that part. I just told Colonel Williams and all his armament to back off, let the CIA go. And I ended up in Langley, Virginia, home of the CIA. And I'm on a table. They strap me down. Door flies open, and in walks Rudolph and friends. And it starts. And that's the first time I felt the needle on the top of the hand. And it was way more fire than the download of whatever it was. And that was my first taste of sodium barbitol and sodium pentothal. And I was under for four days. And I remember somewhere in between waking up and they said, you put, you're only supposed to put a person under no more than 30 minutes. I was under for four days. Rudolph is trying to get things out of me and he's not getting it. And then finally I remember saying, if you give me more Rudolph, he's going to die. He's going to have an eggplant. And he says, I don't care. So, um. Uh, Finally came to, and then there was a big ruckus in the hallway again. I didn't see who it was, but I bet you it was probably LeMay. And anyway, they came back to me and said, um, we're going to send you to Vietnam. You know, you won't live probably a day. I'll be the NW. And I said, fine. So I'm not building any more rockets. So they came back, a few more rockets in the hallway, came back and said, how do you feel about jets? Well, they can be defensive. I can work on them. So fine, you're going to the United States Navy. 10, 11 years later, I am in the United States Navy. I've started off as a jet engine technician. And it's another, take two hours to tell you what some of the stuff happened. Ended up in O&I, Office of Naval Intelligence, officer. And, um, and you think the crazy, this was the crazy story? You should hear that one and what they wanted me to do. And I'm under oath on that one. But I could tell you everything up till now because I was 17 years old. You can't sign a minor to a national security oath. It's against the Constitution. So that's how I can tell you this. And all I can say is you got a pretty good dose of the story and the story's still going because there's a whole lot of things that's not through. And what I've been doing for the last 25 years I can tell you this, there's a second Pithlum now. So, 
the world and y'all, you will get to see it. Wow. But um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to rock this world, buddy. <laughs> and I cheated. I used a lot of designs I saw from somewhere else. So, but it would take me days uh, to tell you all what's in that horn of plenty. But my time's up, and I want to thank you for listening. Bye. <laughs>